Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. My first time in Greece. And unfortunately, I stay here only five hours. So <laughs> first time I hope to come back again, not for a Congress. So um, they asked me to discuss about novel protocols. But I think uh, today the major issue is uh, to, is there, OK by the PC. Uh, today, the, uh, the most important things, I think, uh, is uh, how can we reach the goal? Because every time we discuss with the patients, in our mind, we try to maximize the life birth. We would like to minimize the side effects, obviously. And we would like to find a tailored treatment, a simply and tailored treatment. That's what we think when we discuss with the patients. But it's not so easy to translate into daily practice. So very, it's very, very important to find the right patients, the right protocol, and to find the right protocol for each patient you have in front of you. So the key point is the, the patient selection. But when you decide what kind of patients is in front of you, the, I think, novel key point is, I would like to do the embryo transfer in the fresh cycle or not. And this change, this is the big change in, that recently we have to take into account. So I think today the ovulation induction is just a part of a strategy. And today, every time we discuss with the patients about the possibility to have a baby, we have also to discuss with the patients if we want to transfer in the fresh cycle or if we want to cryopreserve the best embryo and to transfer it in a subsequent cycle. This is the key point. It's very important. And so I will show you the protocols that we apply, that we use every time we decide to postpone the transfer, and why we do that. I would like also to discuss with you about the need to increase or to add LH-ACG activity in particular group of patients. At the end, I would like to you to discuss about protocol infertility preservation and the possibility to stimulate cancer patients starting every day of the menstrual cycle. But again, I think this is what will change our mind. And it's very difficult because you have to change the mind of your physician, your colleague. You have to ch change the time of job in your lab. And you have to discuss it and change the mind of the patients. The protocol is easy. It's the antagonist protocol. It's mandatory. You have to do the antagonist protocol. You can use daily FSH, long-acting FSH, you can have LH, in, and it depends on the type of patients, but it's very, very important that you have to trigger with the analog of general age, and you have to stop the transfer. You have to block the transfer and to freeze, to cryopreserve all the embryos, including the best embryo. Again, you can use the molecules you prefer. Obviously, if you do that with the aim to collect as much as possible oocytes, a long-acting corifolytropin is a very good molecule because engage, and then engage study give show us many information about a good oocyte collection and a good number of embryo cryopreserved. So you don't have to think too much about the gonadotropin. You have just to focus the attention on the strategy. Why to do that? Obviously, if you don't want to have no more OHSS, this is the strategy. I work also in gynecological department. I'm very happy because no more of our patients go in the gynecological department for medication. The hyperstimulation syndrome is close to zero. Not zero, but close to zero. And the early OHSS, it's very easy to manage. 
You can manage it in office, just using antagonist or cabergoline. It's very easy to manage. But you don't have anymore the late OHSS that is the risk for the patients. But not only for reducing OHSS. Because there are some people, the group of Peter Umaidan supported, that demonstrate that sometimes when you are not satisfied about the number of eggs collected in previous cycle, you can use the, ana the analog of general age to ameliorate ovulation, to ameliorate spontaneous surge of LH, increasing the number of mature oocytes that you can collect in the next cycle. I just want to be criticized by you at the end of my <laughs> presentation, and I want just to show you uh, unpublished data on PCO syndrome. We discussed today with the patients where an ovulation is the only cause of infertility. If they prefer six cycle of clomiphene or just only one ovulation induction. It's an overtreatment, I know. I know it very well. But we propose the patients about a mild approach that is clomiphene, that is the approach recommended by the guideline. I know, I know it very well discussing with the patients about the possibility to cancel the cycle, not to find the, the correct dosage of clomiphen, about the risk of um, twin pregnancy in case of two or more follicles, and about the results. When you use clomiphen for six months, you have to expect a result ranging between 25-40% of ongoing pregnancy rate as cumulative results. Or we can discuss about one ovulation induction for IVF, obviously using the protocol that I already showed you, one ovum pickup and cryopreservation of all the embryo, and then only single embryo transfer. In three years, we proposed this approach, and 99 patients uh, were included in this analysis. They were in favor of this approach. We induced ovulation for IVF. As you can see, AMH and AFC were important, were diagnostic for PCO. We collect a lot of eggs. We don't need to use all of them. But we cryopreserved immune-free blastocyst and the first transfer with the best embryo, we obtain 41% of ongoing pregnancy rate. But the advantage is the cumulative. And with a mean of 1.3 transfer procedure, we ranged 59.2% of pregnancy. That is almost double about the approach of clomiphene. I know it's an over-treatment. We can discuss it for a lot of time. But if you really explain it to the patients and give the patient the possibility to, to choose what, is, what does she prefer, you will surprise a lot of patients ask for the baby and want to have the baby in short time. The time to pregnancy is very, very important. And again, another advantage. There are a lot of data, a lot of recent paper that demonstrate that the frozen embryo transfer reduced the risk of obstetric complication. It is very, very important. If you have in front of you a patient with a previous history of obstetric complication that wants a second baby, why you have to transfer in the fresh cycle? This is the problem of endometrium. The endometrium, when it is supraphysiologically uh, exposed to estradiol, reduce the physiological implantation, not only in terms of uh, implant or not implant, but also the placenta probably is, has low quality. And during pregnancy, there is an high risk of preterm, there is an high risk of small for gestational age, there is an high risk of lower weight, 
And in case of previous history of this problem, you, I think, don't have to transfer in the fresh cycle. You can cryopreserve all, and then transfer only one embryo in the frozen cycle. This paper, again, demonstrates and supports this concept. But not only HSS. Again, when you transfer in the frozen cycle, you significantly reduce the risk of ectopic pregnancy. And if in front of you there is a patient, there is a woman with previous ectopic pregnancy, why you have to transfer in the fresh cycle? You can freeze all and transfer after one or two months. Why? Because there is a very, very important difference in tubal uterine environment. Hyperestrogenism increases the secretion of mucus in the endometrium and in the salping. And so it is common to find hydrosalping in patients with tubal disease. And you can postpone the transfer, and you have more chance to have the pregnancy, and you have a lower risk to have the toxic pregnancy. And again, it's very important to hyperstimulate the patients when you want to do screening of the embryo or you need to do diagnostic for the embryo due to genetical uh, disease. You, in my opinion, the screening should not be done in poor responder. It is not cost effective to send just one blast to analyze. The patients pay the screening just to know if the single blasto is good or not, I can transfer it. The risk is an abortion. OK, we can discuss again. But if you want to increase cost efficacy, you have to send to analyze a lot of blastocysts in order to reduce the time to pregnancy. If you've got six blastocysts, but just only one normal, you can transfer only one. Blastocysts, you can perform only one embryo transfer. You reduce the cost. You reduce the cost really for the patients. But to do that, you have to collect as much as possible oocytes. You cannot have only free oocytes. So you have to plan an hyperstimulation, and you have to discuss with the patient about the mild hyperstimulation syndrome, the early mild hyperstimulation syndrome. But it's not a problem, because when you induce and when you trigger ovulation with the analog of GnRH, menstruation happens in five, six days, no more, and the ovaries get small again, and the patient don't suffer about it. It's very important to have more blastocyst if you want to do the screening. Why? Because in women aged 35 years old, only 35% of blastocysts are normal in day three. It's better if you reach the blastocyst stage, but there are less blastocysts available if the patient is aged more than 35. And so, again, you have to discuss before starting ovulation induction about a, pro about a strong protocol. You need to collect as much as possible all sites. You have to go to blastocyst culture. You have to vitrify it, and then to send to analyze, we propose a minimum of three blastocysts when we want to perform the screening. Obviously, all the messages I told you are possible if in your lab there are very good vitrification program, very good blastocyst culture program. The second point of my presentation is the need, I think, to, evalu to, to use LH and ACG activity in other subgroup of patients, where probably you have to transfer in the fresh cycle. So is the, the other population. In the, the first topic of my presentation was a good prognosis patients. Now we are discussing about the low prognosis patients. LH ACG activity is, is necessary because 
it is involved in the first day of the natural cycle. There is a small surge of LH in the natural cycle, and is obviously involved in ovulation. And age is uh, strongly correlated with a dramatic change in ovarian milieu in terms of steroidogenesis. This paper, very elegant in 2005, demonstrate a strong reduction of all the steroid hormone, testosterone, deas, free testosterone, and androstenedione with the age of the patients. So you have to maintain it a little bit more during ovulation induction, especially in patients aged more than 35 years old, higher than 35 years old. It's not so easy to, uh, to understand it before ovulation induction because you have to dose some hormones that are not in daily practice. Uh, or eventually you have to, in the cycle before, evaluate the uh, progesterone secretion after a single bolus of ACG in a natural cycle to demonstrate the corpus luteum is uh, not uh, well functioning or should do an analysis of genetic variants of the polymorphism of FSH or LH receptor. So it's not so easy to find a, a test that will give us information about the possibility to, the benefits to add LH or ACG in, in a simply way. But I think you, this, is a, this is the things that we can do. When we want to, in, in the first part of the counseling, during a spontaneous cycle, you can just evaluate the function of the corpus luteum of the women, inducing trigger with ACG, because you will see that a young patient during the luteal phase produce more progesterone if you compare to an older patient in a natural cycle, after the single bolus of ACG. But I think you cannot, you can also don't do that because you can believe in the literature. There are a lot of meta-analyses that demonstrate that the addition of LH, the addition of a ACG activity, give more possibility of uh, success of our treatment. The addition is, the, the results are in favor of, the, of this approach. And again, in 2012, the health demonstrated. Or you can think about it if in the first cycle you find patients with an unexpected low response. Uh, recently, uh, Nicolas Politzos and, uh, and the Sunkara uh, focused the attention of the suboptimal patients. Suboptimal patients are patients that apparently are okay with a good levels of AMH, a good ovarian reserve when you do the antral follicle count, but uh, they produce less egg than expected. And there are some markers that you can find in a previous cycle. For instance, patients who need more than 3,000 units of FSH are patients that are not optimal responder, or more than 19 units per oocytes collected, or, or that eventually show a plateau of response in day three, day, in day five, day eight, or again, unexpected poor, patients that presented good ovarian reserve but that collect less than three oocytes. I think uh, when you suggest a second cycle, you have to change obviously something and, uh, and you have to discuss with the patients about the need to increase LH ACG activity. We published a paper in 2014 in which in these unexpected patients, we proposed the patients not to increase the FSH starting dose, but just only add a leech. I know that it's strange because when you have a poor responder, the next cycle you increase the FSH. Maybe you double the dosage. 
the number of oocytes collected and the number of embryo transfer was obviously increased, and we obtained a 10% of pregnancy rate. And the last but not least, I think, is the emerging, emerging activity in our IVOF unit, because we have more than 50, 60 cases per year of cancer patients that ask us to cryopreserve all sites before chemotherapy. There are many, many protocols. The message is we can start ovulation induction every day. Octai, CACMAC already demonstrated you can start the FSH in the early follicular phase, in the mid follicular phase, in the late follicular phase, you can induce ovulation and then start. You can move the patient from follicular to luteal phase and then start again. Probably there is no differences. And this is very important also for IVF because uh, sometimes when we collect few oocytes, we start again in the luteal phase, a second ovulation induction, the so-called double steam, and we collect again more eggs if we compare to the follicular phase, and then we freeze all, obviously, because the endometrium is not regular, and then we perform the transfer after a couple of menstruation. In cancer patients, it is well defined that you can start the stimulation every day. You have to reduce the time. You have not to waste days. The patient has no more than 15, 20 days before chemotherapy. You have to go fast. Don't lose days. So as you can see, any visit is OK. Any visit, regardless, the menstrual cycle is OK to start the ovulation induction protocols. And uh, this publication in 2012 demonstrate that there are no difference in terms of oocyte collected, even if you do in follicular phase or in luteal phase. These are our data. Uh, we collect data from two hospitals, my hospital and uh, uh, another public hospital in downtown in Milan. We collect data of more than 150 patients. That is a very big number considering the population. Uh, I just show you the data in, um, of the patients with AMH, AFC, and the outcome. So the data, the, the patient where all the data were correctly collected. As you can see, incredibly, we collect more oocytes in luteal phase. Obviously, all the data were stratified for ovarian reserve. Two years ago, we started using the corifolitropin because uh, we would like to understand if even in this subgroup of patients, using the approach of engaged study. That means we visit the patients, we inject the long-acting FSH, and we visit the patients again after seven days. We remove the visit in day five, because in, we, we give the patients seven days free Unfortunately, the patient has to go to the cancer unit, do a lot of examination, uh, and so we prefer not to visit the patient, to visit the patient as, as low as possible. And we did not find any differences using the daily or the long acting. We obviously correct the results with all the tests of ovarian reserve. And we did not find any differences regardless the cycle. In follicular or in luteal phase, if you use the daily or if you use the long acting, you collect at the end the same expected number of oocytes. Obviously, if the AMH is low, you will collect few oocytes. If AMH is higher, you will collect a lot of oocytes. The advantage, the advantage is clear. 
we reduce the number of injection, and we reduce the number of ultrasound scan. It's very important for these patients, the compliance. This is a very stressed period of a patient that faces the cancer. And so it's very important to find a friendly approach that gives the patient the same possibility to cryopreserve an optimal number of oocytes, but to stay in the IVF unit a few days. Unfortunately, she has to do other things. So, in conclusion, my presentation would like to give a few message, take on a few message that is that are the antagonist protocols plus the vitrification plus the blastocyst culture in patients a good prognosis and to discuss with the patient before starting all the procedure about the possibility to transfer the best embryo, not in that cycle, but one or two months later. But when you have a poor prognosis patient for previous cycle or for some characteristics, why don't you use LH ACG in order to increase the chance? And in all the IVF that perform oncofertility, you can safely use random star protocol. You can start stimulation at the first visit independently from the day of the menstrual cycle. And you can use the daily FSH, you can use the long acting FSH, and you will collect the number of oocytes that you expect, obviously considering the ovarian reserve of the patient. So I would like to thank you for the attention. I would like to thank you again, the scientific committee for this kind invitation, and I hope to be again in Hatton in the next future, maybe for one day more. Thank you.